Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you today to this important event and thank you for being here. Today, we commemorate events that happened on August 29, 1970, 50 years ago. The events are the Chicano Moratorium March and the LA County Sheriff killing of LA Times journalist Ruben Salazar. Together, we will explore the legacy of these events in the contemporary moment and their influence on journalism today. My name is Hector Amaya. I am the director of, this, of the Annenberg School of Communication, and I am here to introduce you the panelists for this important event. Let me start introducing you to our moderator, Professor Josh Kuhn, whose public work and publications have made him one of the most important voices on Latino issues in Los Angeles. He will be moderating a fantastic panel of Latino leaders of journalism and journalism education, award-winning Esmeralda Bermudez of the LA Times, where she covers issues central to, Latino, to the Latino community, including immigration and issues of racial justice. Gustavo Arellano, also of the LA Times, a leader in the field who also specializes on reporting on Latino issues. Professor Laura Castañeda, She's uh, one of our professors of practice of journalism here at Annenberg and one of our leaders in the School of Journalism. And Professor Felix Gutierrez. He's uh, also an emeritus professor of journalism and one of the leading scholars of Latino media studies and journalism, whose works taught me how to think about Latino media studies. Thank you everybody for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hector. Um, really beautiful introduction and so honored to be with, with this incredible all-star crew. Uh, I think Gustavo has decided to remain a man of great mystery and not show his beautiful face. I'm trying. <laughs> um, I, know you'll, I know you'll join us in, in the flesh in a moment. Um, but I just want to thank all of you individually uh, and as a group. Uh, this really is, uh, um, you know, as we just heard, such an important event um, to talk about um, and to gather around, uh, and I could not imagine um, a more esteemed group. So thank you all. Um, just a, a quick note for all of us that um, throughout the conversation, um, there might be moments when some photographs appear that, um, that I, I call up, and all of those photographs were uh, taken by George Rodriguez, um, a long-standing photographer here in Los Angeles. I think George might be watching. Um, so, hi, hey, George, you're out there. Um, and we're actually, we'll, we'll put one of George's photographs up right now. This is the Indians of All Tribes image, um, a very, a, now a very well-known image um, that George took of the moratorium march um, from the roof of a hotel on Whittier Boulevard. Um, and if you haven't seen this in full, uh, you certainly, if you read the LA Times, would have seen it on the cover of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, front and center there. It was amazing to see it in that incredible uh, package that the LA Times ran on Sunday um, about these events that we will be talking about um, in just a moment. Um, for the audience, we're going to have about a 45-minute or so conversation, um, uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free, as the conversation is happening, to, uh, to jot down your questions into the Q&A box, um, and that way I have them ready when we go to the Q&A portion. Um, so I wanted to start um, actually just by asking each of you um, in the most personal of terms, um, just to share briefly what this 50th anniversary means to you on a personal level. Um, Felix, why don't we start with you? Unmute my friend. There you go. Hey Don, mute first. <laughs> on a very personal level, it's uh... Is a connection to a time and a place and a movement that was very important to my life. My wife and I met during the Chicano movement in the 1960s and uh, has been part of our lives for a long time. We're both out of East Los Angeles and it was a massing of people from our community around an issue that really put a punctuation mark over what a lot of us were feeling individually and through uh, individual groups focused on farm labor, or education, housing, other issues. So it was a mass mobilization, the largest prior to the 19 uh, or 2006 uh, uh, immigration marches. 
And so that's still important today. It shows the power then. There's more of us now. There's more potential for power now. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Laura, how about you? Oh, you're still muted, Laura. Hey, I was sorry about that. I was six years old when the moratorium took place, um, not to out my age, but um, so, you know, it happened a long, long time ago, and I don't really remember it as a child, but, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating to read about it now because it was such an important historical moment, and it's a moment that too many of our students, um, certainly younger students, but even college students don't know about. Um, so there's that, but also it's a chance to read about it uh, through the work of some of the best journalists we have today in the Los Angeles Times. As you know, they just put out an incredible series on Sunday. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Esmeralda, how about you on a personal level? Hi, everybody. Um, well, I think as a Salvadoran journalist born in El Salvador in 1980, you know, 10 years after Ruben Salazar and the Chicano mor moratorium, um, this has been a teaching moment for me. I, I, I've, I'm so grateful to my colleagues for taking me through all this history. And I've, been, I've constantly heard the name Ruben Salazar through college and after college. And I often think of what he went through, you know, to make space for Latinos and to create um, just a voice. And, um, but I don't know much about, I didn't know much about him or the history. And I, and as a Central American, I sometimes thought, is this, is this, my, what, does this history have to do with me? Because I'm from El Salvador and I came here after all this happened. And, and without question, there's, there's incredible overlap. And there's also this unbelievable path of resistance that was created by this movement that we all benefit from, you know, whether it be Latinos or the black community or any other um, underrepresented community. So it's really been a teaching moment and also a moment of great pride and reflection, given everything that's happened at the LA Times right now, this historic moment of unity with our Latino staff and the creation of the Latino Caucus, which I'm very excited to talk about later on. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and Gustavo, how about you? Just something I try to say all the time to people anywhere, know your history. And this is the epitome, the Chicano Moratorium, 20,000 people, a peaceful protest ended in uh, police brutality, ended in the death of, deaths of three people, including Ruben Salazar. And yet so few people know about it. And frankly, mostly the only people who know about it are those who live, lived it through or uh, Chicano studies nerds or just history nerds. Like my generation, Mexicanos, you know, children of Mexican immigrants who came here, who came of age in the 1980s, whatnot, it registered to us nothing. If we even heard about it in history, all we would, in, in our classes, it would just be Ruben Salazar. And you see the potential of mass mobilization, of intersectionality, but you also see the disappointment of the police state cracking down on you. And a lot of those issues that they fought for 50 years ago are still today. Too many of us in the military, too much educational inequity, and frankly, you know, too much poverty, and frankly, now you also have the is other issues going on as well. But all that said, you still get hope from what the folks did in the past. So everyone, always know your history. Awesome, thank you. Uh, maybe Jim, if we could see um, uh, the second photograph real quick. Uh, this is another shot of, uh, of March. This, this image, I think, also gives us a really strong sense of the stakes, um, you know, not that about, you know, in, in terms of this being an anti-war movement, uh, anti-Vietnam War march, uh, a peaceful protest that was talking about um, the vulnerability and precarity of Mexican-American life. Um, and I, I wanted to then take that theme, Felix, to you um, and take you back. Let's take us back a little bit um, based on your history with, with the movement itself to Cal State LA, class of 66. Uh, and uh, you were very active as a student organizer in the movement on campus um, beginning in 1964. Um, and I'm wondering if you could share with us about the work you were doing leading up to the moratorium march and then how the march changed the work that you were doing. What impact did it have on organizing and mobilization? And remember to unmute my friend. Unmute Felix. <laughs> I had two, two turns at Cal State LA. One was as a student and a student leader, student body president, editor of the papers. I was a Mexican American, a Mexican making it in an Anglo world. Then I came back to work at Cal State LA as an 
Student Services Administrator in 1967 as the UMAS, United Mexican American Students Group, was just been formed. And they asked me to be the advisor because they needed someone who could sign so they could get rooms so they could meet in. And this was a very different generation than the one that I had been a part of uh, just a year or so before, in that before we tried to adapt ourselves to the Anglo establishment, keep our identity, keep our who we were, but show we, we were as good as the white people, that we could do what they do, we could succeed in their world. The approach of the Chicano generation, which we were all a part of, was to get the institutions to change for us, to change to adapt to our needs, to change to you know speak our language, reflect our food, reflect our culture, to have them change. And so that was a signal change uh, for us in terms of the way we saw ourselves and the way we saw our, our society. I think many of us felt that way, but we didn't know if other people did, or maybe we didn't know how deep we felt it. So with uh, UMAS, United Mexican American Students forming there, UCLA, SC, uh, different campuses, uh, you find out, hey, there's other people that think like me, and the 60s were a period of mass mobilization, protests, pickets, marches, demonstration, things of that type. So we adopted those tactics, not to bring down the schools, but to add to the schools, to add our people as students, as faculties, as professors. My role beyond advisor was working with media and trying to get to cover them, pickets, protests, marches, demonstrations, and things. And in those days, all the reporters in the three years that I was doing that, I never had a Mexican-American reporter show up because there weren't any on the TV stations or in the newspapers. Salazar was overseas at that time. And so you had to explain to the Anglos who we were so they could report that in their stories. Um, if we could see the fourth photograph, Jim, this is the um, a shot of the doorway to the memorial for Salazar's, the memorial uh, of his death. Um, and if I have it right, Felix, you, you did work with him, correct? Well, I knew him. I used to pitch stories to him. He's who you had to talk to to get stories in the LA Times. So when we were doing marches or demonstrations, you know, different community activities that were protests, uh, you would call Salazar. I always got a fair hearing. He didn't always do the stories. Sometimes he'd pass it on to the desk, but, uh, or he'd tell me to leave off the release at the loading dock at the LA Times. He'd never let me in the newsroom or never would give me the okay. Uh, but I always felt I got a, a fair shake. And, you know, reporters, you know, we was besieged by everybody. This is in 69 when he came back and uh, from Mexico City. And so he was having a lot of people pressuring him. And I knew him then. I didn't, I knew him more professionally than personally. Although when I left uh, Los Angeles in 1969 and took a job up at Stanford, he called me and said, uh, hey, so Ruben, how come you didn't tell me you were leaving town? Like we were good buddies and good friends and so I did send him some stories, including one on the high death rate of Chicanos in Vietnam in the autumn of 69, which, uh, which did make the paper. And at that time, Felix, was he seen by other reporters as this kind of game changer, as a, a kind of light who, who might actually transform things? Well, I wasn't in the Times at that time, but the story that I heard was that he was good old Rube. He was one of the boys, he was one of the guys, you know, he'd done his uh, local coverage. Then he'd gone to Vietnam and covered that, showed he could be a war crime as a bureau chief in Mexico City, comes back. So uh, the story is that his colleagues, his newsroom buddies, drinking buddies or whatever, didn't know who he was until he started writing the column after he left the LA Times to become the news director at KMEX in 1970. And then the Times allowed him to write a, a Friday column, which I used to buy every Friday up north of Palo Alto. And he started saying, you know, this is what I feel, this is what I think, these are the issues. And they realized there was a whole side of him that they didn't know. And that's the Mexican-American generation. You show your, ang your side that will coincide with Anglos so they understand you, but you keep your Mexican identity, your loyalties, your you know, feelings and such. And now he could express it uh, when he had the column. Thank you. Um, Laura, I want to ask you, there's something that um, I heard Felix say in an interview uh, that I wanted to share with the panel and then maybe Laura to have you first respond to it. Um, is he said that, that, that in, the, uh, in the 60s, um, we couldn't have an impact in the newsroom, but we could have an impact on the newsroom. Um, and by that, he meant that uh, it was a, a choice, if you will, between being a reporter and intervening at the level of education itself. 
So if you couldn't make the impact as a, as a reporter or as a journalist, you could make the impact in the classroom. Because you, you know, of course, have worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, Dallas Morning News, AP, you freelance for, you know, many newspapers and magazines, uh, and you've also been in the classroom um, for many, many years. What, what's that balance like for you? Well, I think, I think all instructors definitely can make an impact in the classroom, not just with um, Latino students, you know, who are interested in journalism. I think it's with all students. I mean, just over the summer, I had a couple of students contact me and thank me for um, uh, leading a class. It was a it's a required class in Annenberg on uh, emerging communities. Um, they were working on the COVID-19 LA Times project over the summer. Um, and, and in that class, you know, we, we talk about all kinds of communities, um, local communities in Los Angeles, and communities that perhaps aren't based here geographically. They're more, um, uh, you know, communities of interest, perhaps. And they were thanking me because they felt better able to write about uh, the, the disabled or the Filipino community um, because they were able to learn about it in a classroom, which I think, you know, really didn't happen all that much when I was a journalism student here in the 80s um, at, at USC. You know, there was Felix, and he was certainly a huge impact um, on my life. Uh, and he was one of the first teaching electives about Latinos and Latino media. Um, but other than that, even in our required courses, there wasn't a heck of a lot of discussion about how to cover are different communities in Los Angeles, which is really interesting. So when I got back to Annenberg as an instructor, I did see that there was much more of that. And since then, you know, we've tried to, to you know, integrate it into all the required courses and add more elective courses. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we have to continue to do better. Uh, you know, it's not, it has not been perfect, um, but we are, we are trying to do better. So in that sense, you can make an impact not just with Latino journalists and helping make them feel that of course they can, they can do it. They can go out there and they can have a career, but with all journalists, make them, make, make them understand the importance of these communities and how to reach out to the, these communities and come, come for them with empathy. So on that, uh, in, in, that, in that space, I wanted to ask um, uh, Esmeralda, you were, if I have it correct, uh, you, you were an undergraduate um, at USC in the Annenberg School when both Felix and Laura were there. Um, I believe you took classes with both. Is that true? Uh, with, with Laura. No, with Laura. Good. Good choice. <laughs> uh, I never had the privilege of, of being taught by Felix. I wasn't here. I came. Her last semester was my first semester. Okay. And so what, how, how important was it for you that the... Uh, how important was journalism education for you in shaping the kind of reporter and writer that you are now? Um, I have, it's kind of a mixed, a mixed, mixed bag because, you know, I ended up at USC, I think very much by accident. I was always, I, I went through this wannabe Cholita period in high school that really messed up my grades. And so by the time I graduated from high school, no school was going to take me. And so I, you know, I went to community college and I was headed to Cal State Fullerton, just like, you know, so many other Latino students. And it was my journalism professor who said, apply for USC. And I, I said, you're crazy. That's like a white rich school. There's no way they're going to take me. And, um, you know, thank God it worked out. And I, and it, it, USC was always just such a, honestly, just such an overwhelming process coming in as a transfer student that when I walked into Laura's class, I was like in disbelief. I'm like, she's Latina. You got in here and she's Latina and she is so badass. Like, she was just, she just had this presence about her. And I, and I remember, I think it was in my second year that I saw Felix just kind of moving around the building every once in a while. And there was this kind of like very sage-like respect that emanated from him. And I didn't really know much about him, but I'm like, this guy's been through things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but it's, it's incredible how the energies, right, of both Laura and Felix for me were so monumental in this place where I always felt like, Anarimada, like I was just kind of allowed in somehow by I don't know what forces. It always felt kind of accidental to me, and I think you know I, I loved learning about so many of the tools and theories and all these things about journalism inside of the classes, and it was just you. It really felt like this very prestigious sort of experience, 
But the most precious thing to me about attending USC was the fact that it was based in this community that gave me access within 15 minutes to MacArthur Park, to South LA, that I could go and you know be hanging out with Latinos in right outside the door. I didn't have to drive like 20 minutes, half an hour. It was right outside our door. And so that was really the most thrilling experience. And I think the thing that taught me the most was the neighborhoods right around LA, uh, right around USC. And so th this idea of having an impact in the newsroom and having an impact on the newsroom is something that you've now taken your experiences um, from your education, but also your experiences as a reporter at the LA Times, um, and have been a part of a, a really instrumental crew of Latino reporters and editors and writers um, at the paper who are trying to have a, an impact right now. You, and you referenced it earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about the efforts uh, of um, the Latino Caucus and Somos LA Times? So the Latino Caucus is, is a brand new, it's a baby effort with you know tremendous impact. I'm very proud to say we just formed less than two months ago and, and it includes, you know, lots and lots of journalists, just about every journalist, a Latino journalist at the LA Times coming together to form this collective that's called the Latino Caucus. And the point of forming this collective is to basically be a constant presence in demanding and reminding our management that in every single decision that they make and in every dollar that they spend, they have to remember that they're working in a community that's 50% Latino. And, um, and we have put, we started off with some very specific demands, a list of 14 demands that we put before our owner, before our management. And then we followed up with like, I, can't, I think it was like eight or nine pages of very concrete suggestions to implement each, one, each and every one of these demands. And um, you know, we've had these really beautiful, very impactful campaigns on Twitter. Um, this is like all I said in the last what, month and a half. <laughs> So we're, we're really busy, we're very engaged, we're, we're really, I think there's been a tremendous level of work across so many of our very, very talented uh, members. And this is just the beginning, you know, we just got a, a response letter from our owner yesterday, which as, as I'm sure if you've seen it, it's a, a really detailed response. Um, so it, it's a really, it's a new beginning for us. And it's something that uh, it's gonna be a long road ahead, but it's, it's historic what's happening right now at the paper. So for you, Gustavo, um, you, you, you've been at the Times before that, of course, at OC Weekly um, and are now a new columnist at the Times. Um, what, what does this initiative and this movement mean to you um, uh, as a fellow writer and colleague? It's so important because it's preposterous that in a city like Los Angeles, only 13% of the newsroom is Latino. Only 11% of the editors and managers are Latinos. It's completely unconscionable. And of course, this is just the first in many times over the years that Latino journalists have come together and said, no, no more. 1980s, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning Latinos uh, a series that we just digitized, actually. It just came out today, all 27 parts. It's amazing. Right. In the 1990s, people got together to uh, push the Latino initiative, which was this idea that you would see Latinos and Latino coverage through the newsroom. And now here we are another generation later, more Latinos now at the LA Times in the editorial department than ever before. And, you know, we, we follow in the footsteps of our predecessors, our led, you know, men and women legends. And now we just hope to carry that torch and really push finally once and for all. It was different in 1984 when Latinos were a significant minority. We're not a significant minority anymore. We're the plurality of this place. So treat us within the newsroom as that plurality. So you, you mentioned the 1983 package, which is extraordinary. And if, I hope that everybody who is um, listening to this, uh, you can go online and look at that package. I looked at it today and I actually was, was kind of blown away by it. Um, I think I was expecting it not to match up in some way with contemporary issues. You know, I had some bias about it. Uh, a very presentist bias, um, and it's extraordinary. Um, and it, and it, it's also kind of extraordinary in that the topic, you could do the same package today. Um, but I'm just, I, I wanted maybe if you could go a little deeper on that about the archives of the LA Times. I, I've heard rumors, Gustavo, that, that you spent some time um, looking at past bylines and past representation at the paper. Um, I mean, it's actually a kind of a treasure trove of information. It's a treasure trove of the highest points and the lowest points in American journalism when it comes to co the both coverage of Latinos and treatment, 
treatments of Latinos in the newsroom. Uh, yes, uh, your sources are right. I'm doing a history of Latinos in the LA Times and the coverage of the LA Times. And there's some very nasty stuff. But again, the, the, the saving grace of the racism of the LA Times, frankly, has been the reporters within the newsroom pushing against the own paper. And it's a really interesting cross we all have to bear, but we do it proudly. And, you know, in the past, there's been really quick burnout and fatigue. So we only do it, you know, we get the energy, I feel, from our predecessors, the people who have done it in the past, and just try to uh, uh, forge a new path forward. And that's one of the things that I love about both the Latinos package and Ruben Salazar. You read that stuff, it's not just great journalism, it's prophetic. It's prophecy. And I think that's the best journalism that we could do at the time, doing stuff that our competitors are going to be doing years down the line, decades down the line. But that, I mean, and that's what I hope that the management of the LA Times sees with this, uh, with this crew that they have here. It's like, we, not only do we know what we're writing about, but we know stuff in the future. So treat us with respect. So in Sunday's paper, Gustavo, you wrote about your relationship with Salazar um, through, through his, his, his writing. I just wonder if you could just share briefly, it, you know, the, the piece is kind of um, hooked around this, um, this idea for you um, that you wanted a revolutionary writer um, and you found a reporter, if I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. Um, could you just sh share briefly what that experience was like? So in the early 2000s, I was an undergrad at Chapman University, and I was trying to find out how to be a Chicano. In other words, how to be a radical Mexican-American, because that was a term I just learned. So I read Ruben Salazar's inaugural column, What is a Chicano and What is it that he wants? You read it still to this day. It's literary lightning. It's amazing. So I buy a copy of Border Correspondent by UC Santa Barbara Chicano Studies professor Mario T. Garcia. He edited it. And I read it, and I'm like, this is Ruben Salazar, the revolutionary his writing's kind of boring, and he and, and his writing, like I've read this before. I actually, I, I I didn't know how to work it into my story, but I could do it. I share it with you, everyone here, especially with Josh, because he's a nerd. It's like the first time I ever heard "Nevermind" by Nirvana. I heard it maybe three years ago, and I heard it, I'm like all this hype for this. What? Then later on, I had to deprogram myself. It's like no, never mind. They set the template for all the music that followed it. Same thing with Ruben's writing. He's he literally created a journalism genre out of nowhere. No one had ever done a Latino beat in journalism, and he created it. So I mean, you see his stuff as a writer. At first, he's not that good, but he's finding his voice. And that's, this is a tragedy of Ruben. People remember him, remember him as a columnist, but he was only a columnist for the last seven months of his life. From February, from February the 6th until he passed away, his last column came out the day before he died, uh, August 28th. So, he is such a what if, and already he had such a profound impact on journalism. Um, thank you. So I, I wanted to ask a question now related to this, uh, the, the, kind, the kind of topic of coverage, right? And, and Latino writers writing about Latino issues, which in the 1983 section is exactly what you have. Um, uh, and actually in the moratorium package of the weekend was also what you had. Um, and, but, but let me kind of problematize that a little for the sake of this conversation. And so I'm wondering if you all could talk um, or reflect on the, the, the pros and cons of being Latino writers, writing about Latino issues and being seen that that is all that you write about. Um, as Marla, I noticed in one of a, a bio about you once, it, it, you know, it said that you, um, that you write about the Latino community, which you know, politically, culturally, obviously is vital. I, but I'm also wondering, or have there been moments in your careers, and then Laura in the classroom, how do you deal with this teaching wise, where you say, actually, I want to write about Nirvana. Um, uh, and I, maybe I'll write about Nirvana in the Latino community. Um, but I'm just wondering if you could talk about that push and pull between being a Latino writer who is um, uh, always or exclusively writing about Latino issues, if that even is an issue to talk about. You want me to go first, Laura? Okay. Sure. Um, well, there, there is no push and pull for me. I, I came into this business and I do what I do because I want to write about Latinos. I, I don't, it's, um, what you're asking is, is a loaded question that I tend to get quite often. And it's, and I see it as an, as a question that needs to stop being asked because it's not a question that you would ever ask an environment reporter or a political reporter. You know, why do you just want to write about politics? Why do you just want to write about education? Um, 
for me, you know, I, I came into journalism because I, I was this translator for my, my, my family from El Salvador. The, I, I understood through translating for them the value and the magnitude of carrying one story from one community to another and being this bridge and seeing the impact that that information had on my family. And I also grew up with my mom, you know, searching desperately on channel, you know, 34 on Univision for any news about El Salvador and the war in El Salvador and just sitting there at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. waiting for those 30 seconds of news, trying to see any sense of reflection of herself on the TV. And, and that, to me, those two things just were so powerful to me. And, and the fact that I really sucked at just about every other subject except for, I thought, writing. <laughs> I thought I was pretty decent and excited about, you know, reading and writing. So all those things came together for me at a really young age. And, and I, I never, as a kid, thought, like, dreamed about my husband. I, my husband was the LA Times. I was like, I need to get into that damn building one way or another, you know? So, you know, and to write about Latinos, that was it. You know, and so um, it's, a, it's a deeply personal thing for me to create space for this community. And that space means doing it co with complexity, with layers, with nuance. I have a huge, you know, crazy, messy, beautiful Salvadoran family with more than 50 cousins. I mean, I've got people in my family who are priests, people who have gone to federal prison for doing all kinds of, you know, stuff. And so there's this range in my family and I wanna see that range across the pages of the LA Times. And uh, my whole existence in journalism is based around that. And I'm really proud of that. And I don't think anyone at any point should be asking me, you know, hey, don't you want to write about something else? You go write about something else if you want to write about something else. Knock yourself out. So Laura, how, how does that present itself to you in the classroom when you have Latino students um, and they're choosing what to write about and what to report? Well, you know, a lot of students start out wanting to write about Latino issues exclusively, and that's fine. Uh, if that's what they want to do, that's fantastic. And we certainly have a, an outlet for them at Annenberg where they can do that with Vimelo. Um, but what's interesting is as, as they progress throughout the years in Annenberg, many times their interests change. And sometimes they get pushed back because they get pegged as the Latino issues reporter, or um, you know, nobody wants to give a chance to write about sports, or just you know, cover the Dodgers, or to write about entertainment, um, or to write about politics. Uh, and so there's that danger too, and they worry about that as well. So um, you know, how do you maneuver that? I mean, you know, we try and train all our reporters to be able to do to do it all and to do it well, and to be able to be sort of you know. Um, uh, you know, the jack of all trades, so to speak. Uh, and they really have to um, sometimes just make hard decisions. You know, we've had students at Vimelo who, um, because they don't want to get pegged, end up kind of moving into other parts of the newsroom so they're not just sort of thought of as the Vimelo type of reporters. But that, to me, shows that we just have to work on other students within the newsroom. So, so it's not to just look at people who work at these verticals and think that's the only thing they do. Um, and also what, what a lot of these reporters end up doing, I think when they go out and work full time at a news organization is, you know, they may be covering a general beat, um, but within that beat, there are often stories that, that focus on Latinos and Latino issues. And so that becomes part of their beat and that beat just becomes richer because they're doing these stories that others aren't. Um, and so, for example, when I was a business reporter, there were stories that I covered um, that focused on Latino issues and Latinos and Latino marketing and advertising, what have you, that, um, and investing, that no one else was doing at the time. But, you know, and it wasn't technically part of my beat to cover Latinos, but it was part of this, you know, it was part of the beat that I found interesting. So, you know, you see a lot of that, too. Um, so it's, it, it's, interesting because they're young. And so, you know, they think they're interested in one thing and some of them may stick to it, but some of them may not. Um, and Nick Valencia is actually a good example. He's a report, on-air reporter for CNN. He's an Annenberg alum. And, you know, he covers, you know, everything, you know, some of these top stories out there, you know, hurricanes, shootings, et cetera. But he also covers some, some big Latino stories as well. Um, so this, anniversary and these topics that we're, um, that we're exploring are obviously happening um, at an incredibly weighted 
um, and a heavy political moment, um, particularly along the lines of racial reckonings, um, uh, along the lines of uh, anti-racism campaigns and mobilizations, of new generations of political struggle um, and anti-racist struggle. And in the midst of all of that, the words that keep popping up everywhere from USC Annenberg to the LA Times and beyond uh, are words like diversity and inclusion. And I was just listening uh, actually this afternoon to Angela Davis um, talking in an interview that she gave today, talking about her exhaustion with those words um, because for her, they mean nothing. Um, the word she wants to hear is justice. And so I, I'm, I was wondering if anyone uh, on, on the panel could reflect a little bit about um, how justice happens um, in a newsroom um, versus diversity in a newsroom. Are, are they the same thing? Um, no. They're not the same. Diversity and inclusions are legacy of the civil rights movement, of integration of showing that we can come in and work alongside whites or gays can work along straights or women can work along with men, that you can be part of that system. Justice comes after what should come next, which is empowerment. We should go from diversity, inclusion to empowerment. And then when you get people of the empowerment level who can really make changes, who can really see things, who have experiences in their own lifetimes, then you can get to justice. Otherwise, you're trying to sell your issue or your case or your people or your cause to folks who are unfamiliar with it, who don't know of it, that may never even heard of it, except, or if they heard of it, it was just kind of a short headline, one day story type of thing. That's the world that uh, we're in today. And it, it does trouble me as it did with Esmeralda, that people are still being asked, are you a kind of a Latino first or a journalist first? Or is that all you can cover this or that? You know? And Salazar did not cover only Latino issues when he was first there in the early 60s. He was brought back to do that in 69 uh, because they had to show you, I can do everything you can do, plus I can do more. And we shouldn't have to keep having to prove ourselves. If anything, it should be, and I'll take you, Josh, you're a role model of someone who has crossed over into more than one culture, more than one lifestyle, and you understand, you know, people, there's, you're the people, people I'd like to see, like, more people like you, instead of questioning us as to who we are and what we are and why we are here. Well, if that was an attempt to get me to talk about my own Cholita uh, years, <laughs> I, it's not gonna happen. Um, yeah, well, we're, we're both from Happy Valley. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but I, wanna, I wanna kinda drill down a little bit more on this justice piece because it seems to me that the Latino Caucus, for example, is a great example of mixing representational politics with instituting and making interventions toward justice, um, about the diversification of, of newsrooms uh, and making sure that those newsrooms are producing transformative reporting, transformative knowledge, and transformative, uh, and transformative information. Would that be a fair assessment, Um Well, I, you know, as you were talking, I think it's a really interesting question that you're posing. It's for me, you know, yeah, for me, diversity and inclusion is just like uh, my eyes just glaze over when I hear those words. It's, it's really about accountability and results. And so what can you do as a group, right, or as an individual to put measures in place, to, to uh, metrics in place to numerically measure these things, whether it be quarterly, twice a year, once a month, really uh, think specific, con of specific concrete ways that you can go back to management and say, hey, what did you do? What did you accomplish this quarter? How many people did you hire? How many Latino finalists were there? Um, uh, where, are you get where are you getting your candidates from? There's, there's got to be very, there, there's got to be a foundation set up with very specific follow-up because if you just simply go in and just complain and, and bring up these words and the representation and it, stuff just doesn't move. And I, we're, I mean, not, we haven't made stuff move yet, you know, numerically. We're still at that 13%, obviously, but, but I, I, do, I do have a great deal of faith that this is the way to go, to push for accountability, transparency. And also, frankly, I mean, some people might, this might freak them out and make them nervous, but really raw, honest conversation that's going to make people feel uncomfortable. And we've had a, a hell of a lot of that since June at, in our newsroom, in our Slack. 
um, internal Slack channels. I've, I've been like proud of my newsroom over and over again for just speaking up. And sometimes those words are gonna come out with thorns and with nails and with pain and with anger because it's been decades and decades of just kind of no results, you know, very little results. And so, um, like, like, you know, Gustavo said, it's unconscionable. So, um, yeah, you, you gotta have, you gotta have follow up and, and accountability, I think. Um, Jim, if we could see one more photograph real quick and then I'll open it up for Q and A. Um, photo number six, I believe, um, the holding the sign photograph. There we go. Um, this is another one of George's and, um, it's an image I wanted to put to the panel, uh, particularly uh, the young African-American um, ma uh, male who's holding the sign. Um, and I, I wanted to introduce this not to do a history lesson on black and brown solidarity in the past, but to plant the seed for a quick discussion about what this anniversary as a Chicano um, event, quote unquote, um, what it can do and, and, and what it can teach us about the new solidarities that need to be formed in contemporary Los Angeles, um, in a multiracial, uh, hyper multicultural, multilingual city. What what do you all see are, are the the kind of lessons of the movement that can be applied um, to the new futures uh, of this city? I would hope that with all these movements that people see that there's something bigger at play, not just in the group, even with the natural, the, the Chicano moratorium, it was ultimately an anti-war protest. But in this case, it was Chicano saying, our people are dying at a disproportionate rate. How could anyone possibly be against that? Similarly, when people say black lives matter, it's not saying that other lives don't matter. They're just saying that black lives matter. And the more people get that, then that's when you get that, uh, you know, this coalition building to be able to dismantle those systems that oppress everyone. It just starts with black lives. And so you see that wonderful picture right there. It actually immediately reminded me that during the 68 blowouts, in other words, during the Chicano blowouts of East Side, there were also blowouts in Venice High and African-American students were also walking out, but it gets disappeared once we have these narratives. So what I hope also is that when, you know, uh, in, in, we're probably gonna have more stories, but some of the organizers of the Chicano Moratorium were Central Americans. Un Guatemalteco I know was a part of this and those histories get lost when we, we focus too much on the groups at hand and forget, I, you know, this sounds very cliche, but forget the, not so much the humanity, but the justice that's right at the center of all of this. And frankly, these are calls for people who want, who believe in justice and want justice to be done, regardless of your race or ethnicity or class who join this. It's there for you. You have to decide to join it. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment on that topic at all? Um, okay, we can move. We've got lots of questions. I'm not go. I'm warning to everyone. I'm not. We're not going to be able to get to all of these. There's some really, really great questions. Um, as one of though, I'll start with one that's for you. Um, uh, and the question is: uh, First, they say thank you for speaking on your family, and its makeup being a people who have been slash are incarcerated. What advice do you? you give to Latina writers wanting to share their truth without fear of retaliation or attempts to shame them. Sharing our truth can come at a high emotional cost for us. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't entirely understand the question. Like uh, sharing about your own personal family yeah, histories and, and things you've, you've kind of lived, lived I think personal I think, storytelling. I think particularly histories of incarceration. Yeah, but but specifically histories of incarceration, I believe. Um. Huh. I mean, that's quite a specific question. I I, I guess it's coming from the fact that I mentioned that one of my cousins was in federal prison. I, I I've never written about my cousin, um, but I but I I always. I do bring up that example because I want to show that there's just this, this incredible range in my family and. I think, um, I guess one of the things that I could say is that in the last few years, just in the last two years at the LA Times, I, I have began more and more to write from a, a personal place. You know, I've, I've a, a to, a, to a point where it, it really feels like I'm putting myself and my family at risk of being judged. And I don't know what people are gonna think about me. I've, you know, I've written about being yelled at in a playground for speaking Spanish to my daughter. 
I've written about the fact that my family long time ago stopped celebrating Thanksgiving because we just don't, we don't believe in this sanitized version of the happy pilgrims and the happy Indians. Um, you know, uh, so I, I re recently wrote about, you know, just celebrating and paying tribute to our parents who are, you know, some are janitors, gardeners, cooks, and, and so much of LA sometimes sees, or sector of LA sees this community as very invisible. And so um, I think it's, and I, every time I write one of these pieces, I'm so scared out of my mind that people are going to judge, uh, ju look at me and be like, no, what you're saying is false. This is not real, but not, not so much the white community, but the Latinos. I'm like, that's it. You, you're crazy. What do you mean you're boycotting Thanksgiving? That's it. I'm boycotting you. you know? <laughs> so, um, so it's always really risky. And I, and I just, I, I think there's so much power though in putting that nuance and those layers out there. You just don't see it enough. And, it, and it's always incredibly rewarding to see how uh, people often write to me and say, I've never seen this part of my life reflected so clearly in what you wrote. I just, you just don't see this anywhere. And so maybe one day I will write about my cousin who was locked up for, I mean, you can't even imagine what, or my, or my other cousin who's a priest, you know? But um, I, I, it, it's really important, I think, to not, not, to, not to feel any sense of shame about, we're all humans. We all have all kinds of stuff under our closet. You know, it's just how much do you want to divulge about yourself? And I should say to those who are listening um, that if you haven't read any of the pieces that she just mentioned, I urge you to go read them. Um, they're extraordinary pieces. Um, and I think in, in, your, in your writing, if I can say, like that you, when you turn to the personal like that, um, I think those, that, th th those are some of the best things that I've read by you. They're just incredible. Um, so thank you for that. Um, next question is, um, I think we'll be open to anybody on the panel. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the quote unquote pipeline excuse used to justify a lack of diversity in newsrooms? There's well, that's an old, oh. uh, you want to go first, Felix? Well, it's the line that we heard in the 1960s. Can't find anybody qualified to go in the newsroom. There's people like me. I'm walking around with a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern, Medill School of Journalism. Can't find a job in a newsroom. And editors are telling me, uh, you know, can't find anybody qualified. So they always try to push it down the pipeline. And they push it to the schools, the education. So we got pipeline programs, scholarship programs, training programs, special types of things to get people into the pipeline. And in those days, we thought the main thing wrong with the system was we weren't part of it. So we could get in, everything would be okay. Get people in entry level and that people, we did get people in. And as they got in, then they found out there were other issues. And I'll let those who actually got into the pipeline, I never did, uh, as to whether they see that's still an issue today or not. Yeah. Well, first of all, there is no pipeline problem. Um, they may not be looking at the right pipe. Um, as you know, talking to any um, any faculty member, they could give you a long list of, of students, former students, people who are currently out there working somewhere who would be great candidates for entry level positions, mid level positions, even senior editor positions. But what I think happens is that oftentimes there's this uh, institutional bias, right? You know, people like to brag about, well, we hired from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, you know, some of the best people out there don't happen to work at those three news organizations. So they perhaps start, should be a little more open-minded about where they hire. Uh, same thing as far as you know, where they go to recruit from when they're looking at schools. Um, now, you know, of course, all of our students at USC are fantastic, but, um, you know, there's lots of fantastic people at places like uh, at all the Cal States, um, at lots of state schools throughout the country, City University of New York. So, you know, um, you know, don't just go to the usual, you know, Ivy League schools to recruit people for internships or fellowships. I mean, they really have to start thinking a little more creatively and a little more broadly about uh, the type of people they start bringing in to their organizations. They'll find talent where they look for talent. Mm -hmm. And uh, we proved that. Laura was part of the Journalism Opportunities Conference that we started here in 1980 at USC to get from all the schools around the area to show these national recruiters, yeah, there are blacks, there are Latinos, so there's Asians who can do the job. You just have to come out and look. And we, we'll find them for you now. It's your job to hire them. 
Another question we have um, is, uh, as a native Angelino, it has always troubled me that the Times doesn't dive in and cover anything east of the 10 freeway. I'm expecting good feedback from this one. What is the yeah. LA Times yeah. going to do to change this? West LA has always had the coverage. Seems like two worlds exist in one city. I, I would say that person's not reading the LA Times. We're doing a lot of stories about the East Side. Our colleagues, Brittany Mejia, Alejandra Reyes Velarde, uh, Dorani Pineda, este, Andrew Campa, Esme, myself, Paloma, I would really urge you, and this actually gets into, uh, I'm gonna get into this in my big essay about the LA Times. The, the, the idea that the LA Times is so West Side and it's so Latino, it still haunts us reporters who are trying to, who are doing these stories that are going against the previous LA Times that yes, was too West Side, was too suburban. The very LA Times that Otis Chandler once said, blacks and Latinos, couldn't understand that it was an aspirational paper for them. But in the meanwhile, we're not going to pay attention to them. Um, so we are doing those stories. We should be doing more of those stories. And we're trying to do more of those stories. I myself, I've been doing stories from, uh, you know, from uh, San Bernardino. I did a story about a waitress at the legendary Meat La Cafe who had worked there, uh, Esta Lucy Reyes, who worked there for 68 years. Uh, maybe the old LA Times would have not paid attention to it, but I knew about it just based on my work. I did a story about unionizing uh, a, a, a coffee shop that unionized and then all the workers got fired. So this is the importance though of not diversity or inclusion, but getting reporters who know communities are outside like these uh, echo chambers of, and nothing against USC, go Bruins by the way, but mm -hmm. against like Northwestern and Yale and the same colleges that these upper echelon uh, management folks keep hiring from. Well, historically the LA Times did target an upscale white audience. And they were very intentional about it. And they were very open about it. When the uh, population of LA became more multicultural, more low income from their standpoint, they opened an Orange County edition, not just a section. Then they go to San Diego County and open another edition there in 78. So it was easier to buy the LA Times in Orange County than across the street from where the paper was coming out. And I wrote an article with Clint Wilson, an African-American professor, called The Demographic Dilemma, where the LA Times people published in the Columbia Journalism Review in 1979, where they very openly said, yeah, we're looking for upscale readers, and that doesn't include black and brown. And uh, they oh. didn't want it. I, I was just going to add that, you know, in these last, especially in the last two years at the LA Times, there's amazing work that's coming out of Latino journalists and uh, and also non-Latino journalists doing Latino journalism. Um, but uh, having been at the paper for 12 years, I, I've experienced these kind of waves of like, we're going to put resources there and it, it stays there for just a little bit and then it goes away. And there were a lot of conversations in the last decade about the West Side and the investment in the West Side. So I, I totally understand why readers also feel that way. And I just ask you guys to please look now because what you see now is so different than what right. you see five years ago six seven years ago and and and, and look with enthusiasm because it's, it's us the writers leading those stories and leading those movements with a lot of devotion and a lot of hard work and we're doing it for you guys so please please read and please subscribe well one final question that we can squeeze in here and i think it's an important one um uh, from Frank Rojas, who asks, following the history of the Chicano Moratorium and the George Floyd protests from this summer, what do you think is the role of a young journalist of color in the news? Find the stories that really speak to your experience, stories that historically have not been part of mainstream journalism. Go out there and tell those stories. Go, if you're not, if you don't want to tell those stories, seed those stories off to other people. I mean, basically, it, it, it's kind of a weird ask, but what we're asking for mainstream journalism to do is to go tell the stories that matter to the majority of folks as opposed to the quote unquote rarefied folks. So just do your job, that, you know, that's what I would tell young journalists of color, do your job, go find great stories, go find stories that reflect what you're coming from and then go out and do them. I, I would say, um dream dream big work your ass off and number one most of all regardless of what you want to do whether you want to you want to write about ponies transportations latinos you know um insects whatever the hell you want to write about whatever beat you're going to do bring your whole self 
bring everything about you. Do not dull yourself down. Do, do not change your vocabulary because you want to sound a certain way because that's going to make you look better in front of, you know, the more white dominated news that you might be in. Do not leave your food behind, your music, your culture, your heritage, all of that. Bring all of that with you and, you know, and then just do whatever it is your passion is. And, and, um, and I think, I think that's probably the truest version of yourself that you could possibly be in journalism. And we desperately need that. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? Laura, you're seeing the future journalists every single day. What does the future look like to you? Um, I, th I think it looks really promising. I mean, there's so much energy and so much excitement about um, really doing journalism that counts and that makes a difference. So I think uh, we're on a, a very positive road. Maybe one of one of your students will become uh, a Latin music writer for the LA Times. That would be a good. Oh one. well, I I we have need one, one. Who, just, who just graduated and got hired by People Magazine to do just that. So there it is. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you. This has just been a, a fantastic conversation that I actually wish we had another hour. Um, I have lots more questions and I could listen to all of you. So thank you so much. Uh, and for everybody out there, please. Um, if you haven't read the LA Times um, uh, special edition uh, from Sunday, uh, please do check that out. It's a, it's a really incredible package. Uh, and also dig um, on the LA Times website. Where, Gustavo, can folks find the 1983 digital um, edition? Right now, honestly, I don't see, is it on the homepage yet, Esme, do you know? It's on, it's on our homepage, yeah. Yeah, so go to latimes.com or better yet, find Fidel Martinez from the LA Times. Just Google Fidel Martinez Twitter. He has this great thread that explains so much about it. Or better yet, go to, go to la, the Latino Caucus Twitter account. We've been También. tweeting it all day. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here and for your work. Um, special shout out, Felix. It's so great to see you after so long. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for inviting all of us. And I listened and I learned. Uh, and a big thank you to the USC Annenberg tech team who uh, made this uh, happen so flawlessly. All the muting was the fault of the panelists, not the team. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all so much, and I uh, hope everybody has a good night. Right. Thanks, Gracias. Best to everybody. Keep going. Siempre adelante. Siempre. <laughs>